We're starting off yet another week in this strange virtual world. I will always begin by saying I hope that you're healthy and safe and well as can be wherever you are. And thank you for taking a few moments to spend some time with me. I obviously miss our in-person lectures, but also to spend some time with one of the most remarkable world literature writers, Chinua Achebe of Nigeria, and his extraordinary novel, short novel, Things Fall Apart. The song that I was playing for you right at the beginning is one you can actually find on the Purple and Gold website. And I want just to say two words about it in order to introduce our content for today. So the song is called Black Men Know Yourself, and it's a collaboration between a father and son, Femi and Fela Kuti. Fela Kuti is actually very famous for creating a style that you probably all know far more from a band out of my, one of my alma maters, um, Columbia University in New York City, Vampire Weekend the style often referred to as Afrobeat, epitomizes what I want us to have in mind for the whole of today, global cultural fusion. Fela Kuti, who's often credited with creating the style, sings in multiple languages, African English, Standard English, and also local indigenous languages like Igbo and Yoruba that exist in Nigeria well before anyone from Europe comes to visit and to colonize and to dominate them, which is of course the painful history of the late 19th century. Perhaps the signature of Afrobeat, in addition to the language uses that it code switches among languages, is the way the music is written. African melodies, African syncopated rhythms being used, but the crucial foregrounding, the trumpets are particularly obvious in this song, uh, as our guitars, of Western instruments. It is literally a musical style that could not exist in Europe where there are no contact with Africa and could not exist in Africa, although without the choice on the part, for example, of Nigeria, of whether this happened or not, the European mashup with Africa creates this extraordinary expression. And I wanna suggest that actually Achebe's novel is rather like this music. What it will talk about, and that's an intense thing to do when things are so hard in our world uh, as they are today, what it intends to do is to present us a very serious and indeed a very, very painful story in a lot of regards. But its existence alone is what is so remarkable. He began his career as a journalist. He decided the way he wanted to intervene early on in his career was to write about what was going on in Lagos, what was going on in Nigeria, and to make sure that a global public was not only relying upon foreigners, outsiders telling the story of Nigeria. He was a successful um, journalist, and yet at a certain point decided that actually what really can impact people, like Shahrazad telling stories, is writing a work of fiction. And so although we read his essays and his journalistic pieces with great admiration, in fact, it's this novel, this made up novel, drawing on history, but not identical with history, like the Borges text we were looking at, based upon something that happened, but then reimagining it for which he is so admired. So what I wanna do with you today is to introduce a whole series of concepts that are actually related to these last three post-colonial, post-imperial authors, each of whom has a very specific connection with the University of Texas at Austin. And then look at the opening of the novel, taking it up until the painful event that's at the center that triggers a lot of what goes even more stressful and even more wrong in the second half. So I'm going to share screens with you just in a moment, so I'm just about to become very small, so that you'll be able to see <clears throat> some of these images. And let me make sure that those are there for you. 
So what you've obviously got here is the website and I wanted you to know about this one. It's Black Men Know Yourself. The lyrics are actually very much worthwhile to listen to. But where I want to begin with the PowerPoint is actually with this image. So there are lots of things in my life I feel unbelievably lucky to have had the opportunity to experience. But one of them particularly that I found so impactful was getting to meet Chinua Achebe, um, to invite him and host him here at the University of Texas in a year that perhaps is before many of you were even born. Achebe came here and talked to us about the topic of images of Africa, a man of the people and his kind of approach to what it is to represent Nigeria or Africa to a global public. I was hosting a conference. We brought people all over the world to listen to him and to interact with him over this topic. So Borges passed away long ago. I never had a chance to meet him, but if you want to meet him, go to the Harry Ransom Center. We have this entire archive, all of his works. And UT was one of the places that promoted Latin American literature as something that the whole world, not just Argentina, not just Mexico, not just the Caribbean, that the whole world needed to read. Similarly, Achebe used UT as the place from which he would speak about his views of Africa. And finally, if you want to go over to the Ransom Center a second time, um, Garcia Marquez's archive is here as well. We are in University of Texas, <clears throat> one of the places that most vigorously and most importantly has promoted multiculturalism, internationalism, especially looking at Latin America and Africa. And I wanted you all to have that experience. Unfortunately, I can't take you to the lecture from 1998, but what I can do is show you something that he did at the Library of Congress a few years ago before sadly he passed away. So I'm gonna leave his face up there because there are a couple of things I wanna say. And it's actually about a big debate that often comes up when you do post-colonial literature. So the first one, and this is for you to think about, maybe you don't agree with Achebe, is which makes more of a difference? A creative work or a journalistic work? Achebe does both, but in fact, it's his novel, his creative work, that's the one that has most stayed and most been accessed by people to help them understand both Nigeria and the experience of colonialism. Second question, what language should Achebe write in? like the decision to use guitars and trumpets, should he use his local language, in his case, his mother tongue, as he would call it, his Igbo, or should he write in English? And he makes the decision that he's going to write in English, and this is not uncontroversial. A good frenemy of his, they sparred back and forth all the time, is the poet Ngugi Wationgo. And Ngugi was very clear uh, in his disagreement with Achebe. In his disagreement, he expressed in a simple way, why would you grant victory to the colonizer by speaking to them in their own language? So if you speak English or Spanish or Portuguese or Chinese or Russian, any of the great colonial imperial languages, English in the case of Nigeria, aren't you just conceding defeat yet one time every time you speak the colonizer, the master's language? So Achebe gave an interview in 1992 in which he really effectively, I think, captured, you don't have to agree with him, but his view of the matter. He made quite clear the following. I did not get to choose, based on the date of my birth, whether I would learn English. And Achebe was educated in missionary schools that had been created by the British colonial presence. He didn't get to pick that. He was born into that. So he was born into being bilingual, born into speaking Igbo, and into speaking English. And he actually went on and did a degree at a British university where he clearly would have been using a great deal of English. But when asked, well, aren't you just betraying the cause of expressing Nigerianness by speaking British English? And his reply was extremely eloquent, I think. He said, I was given Igbo because I'm Nigerian. I was given English because I am Nigerian and was colonized by the British why wouldn't I speak two-fistedly to make my point? You'll see the text actually has a fair amount of Igbo in it. And I'm gonna pull a little piece out just in a minute for us, even before we get into the text, properly speaking. But he says, having not been the person who got to decide whether I learned English, why wouldn't I use it? He goes on to say, if I wrote only in Igbo, who would read me? Only those who speak Igbo, only those who can read Igbo. Or would I have myself translated? Why wouldn't I write in English myself? I'd like you to reflect on language use, language policies, 
ideas of should we have one national language, two national languages, or no national language at all. But I'm going to say, actually, the English he uses is not simply general, generic, I suppose, since he's British educated, British English. It's something else. And just as you've had to listen to a funny variant of English for both these Zoomed recorded lectures and for our face-to-face -face lectures, I'm going to suggest that Achebe is actually doing something to language, especially to English. He's making it bigger. He's making it richer. He's not speaking British English. He's speaking Nigerian English. And if we just look at the opening page of the text on 2936, I want to show you with what skill he does this. He expands in an elastic way, like stretches English to put new content in it. And actually, the history of the English language has always been expansive. It's always taking in words. And we actually have taken them in for other languages in ways that we don't even remember now. And we think they're English words. So some are obvious. What do you call, for example, the single thing that study abroad students miss the most, in my experience, very quickly after leaving Austin? What do you call a taco? A breakfast taco in Russian, in Arabic, in English, British English even. We call it a taco because the concept doesn't exist. It is a dish. It is a food item. So some things are obvious. Obviously, it's a very specific Texas food, and therefore there's only the Texan way to say it. But other words that we don't pay attention to often coming from South Asian roots because of the British Empire there have so been incorporated in English we don't even think about them. What do we call, for example, the thing you put around your shoulders if you're cold? A shawl. It's a South Asian word. It's not an English word. What do we call, for example, what everyone is always worried about, especially around the world at the moment, with so many businesses being closed? What is everyone worrying about being short of? Cash. Also a South Asian word, not English. So English has always grown because of the languages that it colonizes that it takes over, that it incorporates. And at the very beginning, we get a feel not only for new words, there is a new word I'm going to mention to you here, but actually for the way he's changing how we express ourselves, the content. So I'm just going to use the opening paragraph of the novel. In part one, Achebe begins saying, Okonkwo was well known through the nine villages and even beyond. His fame rested on solid personal achievements, as a young man of 18, he brought honor to his village by throwing Amalinze the cat. Uh, Amalinze was the great wrestler who for seven years was unbeaten from Umofio Mbaino. He was called the cat because his back would never touch the earth. So no trouble understanding any of that. We've obviously got a few names that, uh, depending on your familiarity with Igbo names, may sound familiar or may sound very different to you. But it's about a wrestling match. And this is a way that people show their prestige, kind of like a football game or something. It's the competition that people both enjoy to participate in through prestige and other people enjoy to observe. But he built into it something that's very specifically Igbo. And that is the creation of these little epithets. Amalense is the person's name, but he's called the cat. And he's called the cat because no matter how much you throw him, he always lands on his legs and therefore continues to win the bout. So there's a competition happening between the two wrestlers, and Okonkwo is going to be our hero, our protagonist, very much our anti-hero for the text. And we find out that Okonkwo is also going to have a particular one of these kind of epithets, comparison to an animal, like right back to what we did with Gilgamesh, right, where we have lions and bulls for strength. So Amalinza can't be thrown, he's like a cat, he always lands on his paws. Okonkwo, we're told, is slippery as a fish in water. So Okonkwo is going to be a fish. Again, these epithets are very characteristic of the way Igbo culture represents a person, gives them a little descriptive phrase so that it captures the core of their character. So we're not having any trouble understanding that, right? Fishes are impossible to hold on to, and therefore if you're wrestling a fish, it will always escape from you. Second paragraph is got the fish image. Third paragraph. That was many years ago, we're told, 20 years or more. During this time, Okonkwo's fame had grown like a bushfire in the Hamtan. So here's something a little different.